This is a zebrafish that has been genetically modified to make each cell fluoresce a different color. The model was used by a team of Taiwanese researchers to discover a new type of cell division where the cells divide without replicating their genome. This newly discovered type of cell division is called asynthetic fission. In this video, I will outline how it is possible to genetically modify any organism and make each cell fluoresce a different color. Also, I will outline the discovery of asynthetic fission. Zebrafish is a vertebrate species commonly used as a model organism for research. Young zebrafish have transparent skin, making it possible to observe their organs without dissecting them. To understand how the researchers were able to make each skin cell fluoresce a different color, we need to understand this genetic construct. This is a piece of DNA that has four fluorescent protein genes, six lock sites, and a ubiquitin promoter in front. The story of fluorescent proteins starts with the jellyfish Aquora victoria, a jellyfish that can use chemical energy to emit green light. One of the proteins responsible for this bioluminescence is green fluorescent protein, GFP. GFP emits green light whenever blue light is shined upon it. All proteins are the product of a gene. Genes encode the information for what amino acids should be in the protein. By using specific DNA cutting proteins, a gene can be isolated from a genome. The gene can then be inserted into a different genome by injecting the gene into a fertilized egg. This organism will now gain the trait of fluorescing green light whenever blue light is shined upon it. Most of the chemical structure of GFP exists to stabilize the core. In the core, we find the chromophore, the part of GFP that absorbs blue light and emits green light. By inducing mutations in the part of the GFP gene that encodes the chromophore, other colors have been developed. From GFP to blue fluorescent protein, cyan fluorescent protein, and yellow fluorescent protein, making it possible to make organisms fluoresce green, blue, cyan, and yellow-green. A very distant relative of the jellyfish Aquara victoria, Discomas species, has a different fluorescent protein known as Discomas red, DS red. The part of the DS red gene responsible for the chromophore has also been mutated to give a range of different fluorescent protein colors. M. sherry in red, M. banana in yellow, M. raspberry in pink, and M. plum in purple, making it possible to make organisms fluoresce red, yellow, pink, and purple. Computer screens. Computer screens can display every color, yet if we zoom in enough, we see that each pixel consists of three colors, red, green, and blue. To make an organism fluoresce any specific color, all we need are three fluorescent proteins, one in red, one in green, and one in blue. The researchers used M. sherry, yellow fluorescent protein, and cyan fluorescent protein for this purpose, as well as a fourth fluorescent protein called UV fluorescent protein. The ultraviolet light produced by this protein cannot be observed by the human eye, but can be detected by machines. The purpose of this protein is as a selective marker. To summarize, by inserting a combination of genes for M. sherry, yellow fluorescent protein, and cyan fluorescent protein, a wide variety of colors can be achieved. However, the fluorescent proteins alone are not sufficient to make each individual cell fluoresce a different color. To achieve this, LOCKS P sequences have to be used. Bacteriophage P1, a virus that infects E. coli bacteria. In the genome of this virus, there is a gene that encodes the protein Cree recombinase, or Cree for short. The Cree protein can bind four identical copies of itself to form the active version of the protein. The active form of the protein can then bind two LOXP sequences. 
each LOXP sequence is 34 nucleotides of DNA. Cui recombinase acts on the LOXP sequences by inducing one cut in the middle of the sequence. The cut DNA is then recombined together in a different way. The recombination effectively causes everything in between the two LOXP sequences to be cut out of the genome, including one of the LOXP sequences. Keep in mind that this only occurs if the Cree recombinase gene is present in the genome of the cell. The gene produces proteins if the promoter sequence in front of the gene is active. In this example genetic construct, if Cree recombinase is produced by the cell, then it will bind together the two LOXP sequences. The LOXP sequences will then be cleaved in half. The blue right on the top will be switched for the green right on the bottom. Free recombinase then disassociates and the circular piece of DNA on the bottom is degraded into nucleotides. The promoter now causes green fluorescent proteins to be expressed instead of the target gene, causing the cell to lose the function of the target gene and fluoresce green. This system has been further developed by molecular biologists to have further flexibility. The Cree gene that produces Cree recombinase have been altered by adding part of an estrogen receptor gene. This makes Cree recombinase inactive and unable to act on the LOXP sequences. However, if the chemical tamoxifen is added, then tamoxifen will bind the estrogen receptor and reactivate Cree recombinase. This makes it possible for us to determine when Cree recombinase should be active and cut the LOXP sites. By mutating the spacey region, shown in white, multiple different LOXP sequences now exist. These LOXP sequences, or LOX sites, are not cross-compatible, meaning that there won't be any cutting between LOX3 and LOX2, or LOX2 and LOX1, or LOX3 and LOX1. Only cutting between LOX3 and LOX3, LOX2 and LOX2, LOX1 and LOX1. The construct has three lock sites, giving four possible outcomes for the recombination. Outcome number one, no recombination. This is the natural state of the construct prior to Cree recombinase being active and cutting the lock sites. The ubiquitin promoter in front will express UVFP and thereby produce ultraviolet fluorescent proteins. Outcome number two, LOX1 recombination. Cree eliminates this portion of the construct and the ubiquitin promoter will now express the m sherry gene, producing m sherry fluorescent proteins. Outcome number 3. LOX2 recombination. Cree eliminates this portion of the construct and the ubiquitin promoter will now express the yellow fluorescent protein gene, producing yellow fluorescent proteins. Outcome number 4. LOX3 recombination. Cree eliminates this portion of the construct and the ubiquitin promoter will now express the cyan fluorescent protein gene, producing cyan fluorescent proteins. This shows how one copy of the construct will produce either red, yellow-green or cyan cells. But by inserting many copies of the construct, a wide variety of colors can be achieved. The process to insert many copies of the construct starts by crossing two normal wild-type zebrafish together. The fertilized eggs are then injected with the palm skin construct, flanked by two sequences called ICE1 and a protein called ICE1 meganuclease. The meganuclease is a protein that will insert many copies of the construct right next to each other by chaining together the ICE sequences. This insertion of multiple copies will occur at a random site and randomly at one of the 50 chromosomes. This insertion method essentially leads to three possible outcomes. The first one being zero insertions. The meganuclease failed and didn't insert any constructs. The second one being one insertion. Multiple constructs are inserted at one specific site of the chromosome. And the third one being more than one insertions. So we have multiple sites where multiple constructs have been inserted. 
Having multiple insertions will cause unwanted gene problems. Because of this, we want to remove all the offspring that has more than one insertion and all the offspring that has zero insertions. The eggs develop into zebrafish larvae and at this point, we don't know how many inserts each offspring has. But remember, the construct has a selective marker, UVFP. All offspring that has at least one construct inserted will fluoresce ultraviolet light. By using a machine, we can detect which fish fluoresce on ultraviolet light. The fish that don't fluoresce ultraviolet light have zero insertions and are removed from the population. The remaining offspring will both have individuals with one insert and individuals with more than one insert. Removing the offspring with more than one insert is a bit tricky. By crossing a zebrafish with more than one insert with a normal wild-type zebrafish, then its offspring will have multiple 50-50 chances at getting a chromosome with an insert, effectively causing roughly 75% or more of the offspring to have at least one insert and therefore fluoresce ultraviolet light. So all the individuals that produces offspring, of which 75% or more fluoresce ultraviolet light, have more than one insert and needs to be removed from the population. A zebrafish with only one insert, when crossed with a normal wild-type zebrafish, only has one 50-50 chance of getting that one insert from one of the chromosomes in the chromosome pair. So by having roughly a 50-50 between offspring that fluoresce ultraviolet light and the ones that don't, we know that the parent only has one insert. The offspring of this parent that fluoresces on ultraviolet light is then kept into a separate aquarium as a successful line. There is one problem left to solve, getting the gene for Cre recombinase inserted into the genome. In the case of the researchers, it was achieved by this construct. First thing to note is that it has flanking ICE1 sites, so that it can be inserted by ICE1 meganuclease. The second thing is that it has a TET3G site. TET3G blocks the ubiquitin promoter and therefore blocks the production of Cre recombinase. However, by adding the chemical doxycycline, it unblocks the TET3G blocker, causing production of Cre recombinase. Besides Cre recombinase, there is a CMLC2 promoter along the gene for M. Sherry. The CMLC2 promoter is only active in the heart tissue of zebrafish. This causes M. Sherry proteins to only be produced in the heart of inserted zebrafish and therefore their hearts will fluoresce red. This is a selection marker for the construct in the same way that ultraviolet light was a selective marker for the other construct. The same exact selection process is done with this construct as the previous one. Now there are two tanks, one with the first construct and one with the second. Crossing together one fish from each tank will give one fourth of the offspring with neither construct and therefore no red heart nor UV fluorescence. One fourth offspring with only the palm skin construct and therefore only UV fluorescence. One fourth offspring with only the Cre recombinase construct and therefore only the red heart fluorescence and one fourth of the offspring with both constructs and therefore UV fluorescence and red heart fluorescence. Only the offspring with both the traits and therefore both the constructs are kept further. When the offspring are four days old, they are moved to a tank with the chemicals doxycycline and tamoxifen for three hours. These chemicals are slowly taken up by the skin cells. As the concentration of doxycycline increase in the nucleus of the cell, it starts binding the Cre construct, activating the production of Cre er As the concentration of tamoxifen increase, it starts binding the estrogen receptor of the Cre er proteins, causing the Cre recombinase proteins to become activated. As the concentration of active Cre er increases in the nucleus, it will start binding the lock sites and cause elimination of portions of the palm skin constructs. For each construct, there is roughly one third chance of selecting either LOX1, LOX2, or LOX3. 
by randomly rolling a dice, this construct rolled a 3. Box 3 recombination. Over the next 3 hours, most of the constructs will have a portion randomly eliminated. This specific cell ended up with 2 m sherry genes, 1 yellow fluorescent protein gene, and 4 cyan fluorescent protein genes. The ratio between the genes will determine the ratio of the fluorescent proteins. After the 3 hours, the zebrafish are then moved back to a normal tank, and over time, the concentration of fluorescent proteins will start to increase, slowly increasing the fluorescence of each cell. Each cell has different ratio between the fluorescent protein genes and therefore different ratio between the fluorescent proteins, giving each cell a random color. What was unexpected for the researchers was that when they observed these outer skin cells of the zebrafish, they observed cell division. Two previous papers with very long names demonstrated that the outer skin cells of zebrafish older than two days do not replicate their genome. Genome replication is an essential part of cell division, so how could they observe cell division if it had previously been demonstrated that there was no genome replication? Either the two previous papers were wrong, or the cells were dividing without replicating their genome. To determine which hypothesis was correct, the researchers did several tests. The first test being DAPI intensity. DAPI is a fluorescent molecule that binds the minor groove of DNA and fluoresces blue light, making the DNA, and therefore the nucleus of each cell, fluoresce blue. The intensity of the fluorescing blue light is proportional to the amount of free DNA in the nucleus. The outer skin cells that had divided once had a 34% decrease in DAPI intensity, and the cells that had divided twice had a 60% decrease in DAPI intensity. This indicates that the amount of DNA in each cell is decreasing as the cells divide, favoring the hypothesis that there is no genome replication. The second test was an EDU assay. EDU, or 5-ethanyl 2-prime deoxyuridine, is a chemical very similar to the nucleotide thymine found in DNA. Genome replication occurs by adding free nucleotides such as adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine to the free end of DNA. EDU and thymine are so similar that if there is any genome replication while EDU is in the nucleus of the cell, then EDU can be integrated into the genome instead of thymine. EDU has a free binding spot where a fluorescent molecule can bind making the DNA fluoresce some color. Only cells that have synthesized more DNA after EDU has been added will fluoresce a color. So DAPI binds all DNA, while EDU only binds newly synthesized DNA. DAPI will reveal all the cells, while EDU reveals all the cells that has recently undergone genome replication. This makes it possible to compare the number of cells that replicate the genome to the total amount of cells. Out of 17,809 outer skin cells observed by the researchers, zero had an EDU signal. This is very strong evidence that there is in fact no DNA replication occurring in the outer skin cells of these zebrafish. The last test I will go through is hydroxyurea inhibition. As previously mentioned, DNA synthesis occurs by adding free nucleotides such as adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine to the free end of DNA. The chemical hydroxyurea inhibits the synthesis of free nucleotides. So if hydroxyurea is present in the cell in high enough concentration, then there won't be enough nucleotides to replicate the genome. This will force normal cells to stop dividing, since genome replication is a vital part of the cell division. Adding hydroxyurea to the outer skin cells of zebrafish did not prevent the cells from dividing, meaning that the cells are dividing without replicating their genomes. This is a new type of cell division never seen before. In asynthetic fission, the first cell is 2N, meaning that it has two sets of chromosomes, one set from the father and one from the mother. 
the cell then divides without replicating its genome, producing two daughter cells that have less than two chromosomes. The cells may divide another time. These daughter cells will have less than one set of chromosomes. In general, all cells produced by asynthetic fission will lack chromosomes and therefore lack essential genes required to be a normal cell. To put asynthetic fission in the context of mitosis and meiosis, mitosis first replicates the genome, creating two copies of two sets. The copies are then divided, giving two daughter cells with two sets of chromosomes. Meiosis also starts with replicating the genome, creating two copies of two sets. The sets are then divided, giving two daughter cells with two copies of one set chromosomes. The copies are then divided, giving four daughter cells with one set of chromosomes. Asynthetic fission does not replicate the genome. It divides the chromosomes randomly to each cell, giving a lack of chromosome to each cell. Asynthetic fission can occur twice in a row, producing either two, three, or four daughter cells. A type of division that produces cells with incomplete genomes does not make much evolutionary sense in most tissues. However, the primary function of these outer skin cells is to cover the surface of the organism. These zebrafish are young and rapidly growing, meaning that their surface area is also rapidly growing. Asynthetic fission occurs without producing that much new cellular components, meaning that it's not spending that much energy and nutrients. However, just two divisions gives a 59% increase in surface area, indicating that the true evolutionary benefit of asynthetic fission is to increase the surface area for free. As the zebrafish get older and their growth rate stagnate, all the skin cells produced by asynthetic fission are shedded and replaced by cells with complete genomes.